Spring it on with 40 to 70 percent off almost everything at Gap Factory and GapFactory.com. Matching styles for the family are on sale too. Shop it all through April 12th. Nurses showed so much love to my niece, Piper, when she was born. Their care for her inspired me. So I decided to switch career paths to nursing and enroll in Marion University's Accelerated Nursing Program. Designed for non-nursing bachelor's degree holders, it offers a 16-month path to a nursing degree and blends online and hands-on learning with clinicals at Ascension St. Vincent. What are you made of? Search Marion ABSN to learn more. You have to be really intentional about putting a team together. I was in! Crawl out of the pile and started screaming. How good is Joey Bosa? Huh? Rolling, looking, throwing, end zone, touchdown! It's intercepted, Derwin James. Derwin was there with you got to be on a mission every day in the NFL. But even more than that, you got to be on a mission together. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped. And Jake, I know that you have a little bit of the brown stuff and a glass with the ice on it. And your oh, yeah. shirt on. Mm-hmm. Uh, folks can go to manscaped.com, use the code UNLEASH, save 20%. You guys can get anything that Manscaped has to offer. Again, 20% off and free shipping. Use the code Manscaped. Their products are great. Monmore 4.0, they've got it all. Uh, highly recommend for your loved ones or for yourself, for anyone who thinks that they could use some help. Now, Jake, where were we? Welcome to another episode of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. We have, Dan, it's so nice to bring our special guest in today. It's been way too long. We haven't spoken with him since the draft. If you guys have been watching him, I guess we can actually now officially call him a colleague, not just a friend of the show, but we can call him kind of a colleague now. Chargers reporter for Sports Illustrated, co-host of Compass on the Beat, friend of the show, colleague, and of course, lover of corn dogs. Fernando Ramirez joins the show. Fernando, how are you, buddy? Dude, I'm looking bull, bull BS. I have not been on here for a long time. I wasn't even on here as Chargers Unleashed. It's been a while. So I'm calling BS. I was looking through my phone. There's no way. Well, it's I said been, it was been, prior to the draft. It's been a minute. Prior to the draft. Prior to like the prior season to Staley. last year. <laughs> I don't think I've been on here with Staley being here as the uh, nope. as the head coach. So there you go. I mean, you guys have had okay. a tranquil on Rashawn Slater. So obviously I'm not as important anymore. Okay. so. Maybe to be oh, more your specific. Down. <laughs> maybe to be more specific. <laughs> maybe it was if now if I look back and I remember correctly, it may have been the week after Anthony Lynn got let go. Maybe it has yeah. been that. Yeah, one. right around there. You lose yeah. some weight, Father Pat. Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I want. I was wanting. I was wanting to you to, to respond the way he responds to Jackie Moon, but yeah, you, you can't. It's a. It's a kid show. Kid show. Kid show. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Corn dogs, Jackie. Exactly. <laughs> Corn dogs. Ah, oh, Fernando. Uh, first off, obviously, great having you on the show. Uh, from what you and uh, Gilbert have been doing on Compass on the Beat has been nothing short of phenomenal. Very entertaining. Again, if you have not watched the show, you need to go and do it. But thus far, we haven't since, again, as you said it, we haven't talked to you in so long. How's everything been? How's the family doing? How are you, sir? Family's good. Um, I... Had a slip and slide over a slap and slip and slide incident over the weekend, uh, where we were slipping inside and I threw my brother WWE style. I was running on the slip and side. I slipped, fell, and hit myself. It's I put it on my Instagram because I I had recorded it. I like I recorded it and I put it on my Instagram. People were like, "Dude, you must like be hurting." I'm like, "Yep, hurting, but it's fine. We get up, we get back up again, and we start. We keep on sliding." I uh, did that for about three days. My uh, my little nephew was like. Let's go out today. Let's go out and do a slip inside. I'm like, oh my God, this, this crap's exhausting. I'm like, I had to have burned a couple of calories. Come on, I'm like all this running and sliding. But uh, yeah, I know you mentioned Compas on the Beat. We're having a lot of fun with it. Uh, literally, like, it's funny because Gilbert's the opposite of me for everything. I'm energy. Gilbert's a little bit more relaxed. 
I watch movies. Gilbert is like barely catching up with Harry Potter three and oh, four. No. I'm like, welcome to the freaking to the 21st century. Like, come on, how the hell That's are you barely watching these? And he's at, I think he's at, I think he just watched the third one and he's about to start the fourth one. I'm like, Gilbert, like, you need to catch up and catch up quick. He's like, I'm watching it at my own pace. I'm like, well, crap, if that's going to happen, you're not going to watch the last one until, like, January or February. <laughs> and he just started laughing. And, um, but, yeah, no, we we bring the fire. Like, literally, we talk about dumb stuff. Like, we talked about a quiet pl- We reviewed A Quiet Place 2 the other day. Recommend it. If nobody yes. watched it, go out and watch it. Was good. Good. It's my first time back at the theater, which was exciting. I'm going to go back again soon because Fast and Furious 9 comes out. If people haven't heard it on Compas on the Beat, I'm excited Toretto. about that. My boy John Cena is going to be a heel. I've never seen. I saw that back when he was a doctor of thugonomics in WWE, oh but I didn't get to see God. the later version of John Cena as a heel. So I'm excited. I keep on hearing good stuff about it. So I'm hoping I, I don't get disappointed. I hope it's some. I think one outlet called it the rebirth of the Fast and Furious franchise. So I got very excited about that. I know it's oh. number nine, but don't look at numbers. Age is just a number. Let's just let's just enjoy for what it is. They're aging like a fine wine, aren't they? Hey, I love I've loved it. I love the franchise. They brought on The Rock. The Rock really revitalized the whole franchise. So maybe the addition of John Cena also does that. But yeah, that's just all I've been doing. And then covering Brandon Staley and uh kind of the new energy that he's brought to this team. It seems different than before. It's not it, it just seems like like the players are really bought into it. Joey Bosa the other day tells us uh, tells us like I'm excited to be a charger, and I'm like <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, like when Joe, when a guy like Joey Bose is excited about stuff, that means everybody needs to get fired up in the building. Everybody like, needs building. to pay attention. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the video, but the charge released a video where Joey drops back into coverage and he's covering Austin Eckler. And like, obviously, Brandon Saley's like hyping him up. And I'm like, did Joey Bosa really knock the ball down? Like, I, they, they didn't show the rest of the video. They just see, like, all you see is like Joey covering him. And then all you see is them cut to Brandon Staley, and they're like, "Good job, Joey." So I'm like, "Oh, did Joey knock the ball down? Like that would be really interesting." Which I mean, is all, which is also weird. We've literally, I don't think we've I ever know. seen him drop back. Not even, not once. even in six, not even in sixteen when he was under John, uh, John Pagano in the three four. He rarely, if ever, jumped dropped uh, dropped back. So over under three interceptions for Joey Bosa this season, Jake. You taking it? Ooh. I think he's gonna. I think he'll get. I think he'll get a couple just because he, he's gonna surprise the opposing quarterback. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I'll say. I'll say he gets two. I mean, you know, a good, very good line to place. So if if that that definitely sounds like a Vegas line, and given what we've what you're talking about as far as OTA, that's a fair line. But you know, I'll I'll keep it low. But it that still even getting two picks for Joey Bosa is some nice expectations. Exactly. Now, now, Fernando, one of the questions that we have talked about at nauseum, but we haven't had a chance to talk with you live since it actually happened. You're there at OTAs. You've seen Brandon Staley do his thing, and you've kind of seen the old regime as well. Like, tangibly, tactically, like, what, what do you feel is kind of the biggest difference just with, like, this new coaching scheme and Brandon Staley? The energy around the players. They they seem really energized by this. Um, I mean, I, I know you guys have seen what happened with the 49ers with some of the injuries that they've had. Uh, Houston didn't even do a mini camp, uh, I believe. I don't think San Francisco did a mini camp either because of all the injuries that's sustained. It, uh, Corey Lindsley said that Brandon Saley asked everybody, what do you guys want? How can we go out there and work, but at the same time accomplish, and, but at the same time you guys be safe? So they went with this design of uh, they were only going to be in in shorts and jerseys, no no pads, no helmets, no nothing. I I was there when Melvin Ingram tore his ACL in 2013 during min, during uh, OTAs. I was there when Hunter Henry. Well, I was actually next to MJ Acosta from NFL Network. We're standing there, and Hunter's coming towards us. He makes the grab, falls to the ground, and he's uh, he looks like he grabs his leg. And I told MJ, oh, like MJ tells me, she's like, oh crap. I'm like, what? She's like, dude, that's not good. And I looked at him and I'm like, ooh. And he walks off gingerly and I'm like, ooh. I'm like, that might, that could be it. So I, I'm no stranger to watching some of these injuries happen. So, Derwin last year? Derwin, well, Derwin was uh, training camp. But yeah, no, definitely, um, definitely agree. So he listened to the players he took. And that's what I'm excited for, training camp, to see 
what new nuances he brings out. But um, but here it was it was interesting to watch the way Brandon kind of took command of this. Uh, usually, so the way Chargers Park is, there's two fields for guys to practice. Usually, everybody's on the same field. Not here. Brandon took. I, I, I I'm not gonna say the third stringers, but it was like a lot of rookies and uh, Easton Stick and some of the other offensive linemen. He put them at a different field and had them practice there. And I'm like, why would they practice? And then we asked Brandon, and Brandon's like, sometimes some guys don't get looks at all during these times. Like sometimes the the fourth string running back, or he, and he didn't say string, but he's like, some running back, some receivers don't get looks at. Here we send some coaches with them; they get looks while the first team and second team are also getting looks. So everybody's getting looked at without generally saying they're getting looked at. And if, he, if that makes any sense, so basically he was working two different fields. And everybody was getting looked at to see who can really. He said, "That's the way you find uh, the the Austin Ecklers. That's how you find some of the the Antonio Gates. That's how you find some of these guys that you don't even know who you have in your camp, but end up coming out and uh, they really show off." So, I think that's the the energy that Brandon Staley's brought to this team. A lot of players are saying they're excited about the energy that he's brought. They're excited about the new culture that he's bringing, and they're excited about the new coaching staff that he's brought in. So I think that's one thing that I, I really look at with Brandon, and I say, wow, he really is accomplishing what he set out to do. Plus, when you have a guy like Jalen Ramsey speak about him and the way he spoke about him, that there's no way you can go wrong with hiring a coach like him. I still remember the quote that you put out uh about Brand Staley saying that about his practice mythology as far as yeah. put you know maximizing your time basically what you can do with all these players being able to to see uh, you know getting everybody the maximum amount of time to get the most reps as possible rather than just spending most of the time having your starters do it i thought it was a very great quote that you put out fernando just as far as um explaining to people and and for staley to do it talking about just overall player efficiency and growth i thought it was fantastic yeah i know and and that's the thing is that brandon really and this is what I'm expecting. I'm expecting one or two guys to really make the roster who are undrafted and really show out. Like it's gonna be a, it's gonna be two guys. One of one of the guys that I have is Amen, the guy from uh, Oklahoma State, the linebacker. Um, I asked uh, Darius Swinton about him for special teams, and he said Amen is a guy that really just goes out there and he he's he's a a bully. He's like he knocks guys down. He does a lot of dirty work for us. I was like, okay, that means he's starting to take a look at him as a special teams player. Because that's another thing. Fans forget, the Chargers need to fix his special teams. That's going to come down to some of these roster bubbles where people are like, "Eh, is this guy going to make it? Is that guy going to make it? The question is going to be, can he play special teams? That's really going to be what separates some of these guys. Even the sixth, seventh, and eighth, well, eighth, sixth and seventh round draft picks, that's what's going to separate them with some of these other guys, maybe undrafted guys also. If you can play special teams and you can play your position well, you're gonna make the you're gonna make the th- 53 man roster. So I really think Brandon's gonna take a look at every single eight. I think it's 86 guys right now or 85. I think they're at 85. And the reason they're at 85 is because after the first preseason game, you have to cut five players. So uh, I think Tom is. I think the Chargers are just gonna want to go with the uh, um, with already the 85. Why have to cut down? So uh, so I think they're gonna stick to at 85, but. I think Brandon's going to really take a look at every single eight. Oh, I mean, obviously you don't have to take a look at Keenan, Justin, and some of these other Gory Lindsley and all that. But I think he's going to really pay attention to some of these guys that are in the back end of this uh, roster and really see, is there any way these guys can help me? Because like he said, that's the way you find the Austin Ecklers. I mean, hell, a couple of years ago, the Chargers had Wes Welker on the, and it's funny because on this other podcast I do with Lorenzo Neal, he told me, he's like, I could tell, I could tell uh, Wes could play. Um, he said Drew Brees could tell that Wes could play. A lot of people knew Wes could play, but at the end of the day, it was between him and somebody who would play special teams, and they decided to cut uh, Wes Welker, and that's when he went to and he went to Miami, and then uh, he asked me after he got cut in Miami, hey, can you make a call and, and find a team for me? And I guess Lorenzo called one of his buddies who worked with the Patriots, and the Patriots picked him up, and you saw what happened when he went to the Patriots. So, of course. Um, so, I mean, that's how you can – that's how you you separate those guys. You have to be able to find talent, and that's really what this guy's done. That's why a guy like Nazir Adderley is who we're all looking for. Like <clears throat> when you speak to the media, Nas is a guy that I think could end up 
turning into a John Johnson the third kind of for Brandon Saley in his defense because of his versatility, the way he's able to ball hawk. I think he's a guy that really could his stock could go up high if uh, if he buys in, which it sounds like he has. Ronaldo Hill, defensive coordinator, said that he loves exactly what Nas is bringing to this secondary. So it's it's one of those things that gets guys excited. Um, but yeah, no, definitely fa- uh, the players are excited to to be there with Brandon and kind of they love his philosophy. So they've they've it seems like all eighty five players have really bought into what Brandon is uh, preaching to them. Let me touch on that a little bit, Fernando, because you led into that. It's definitely something that I wanted to talk about with you. You released a piece earlier this week, uh, three defensive players that you thought were going to take mm-hmm. the next leap in Brandon Staley and Ronaldo Hill's defense. And you already mentioned one of them and being Nasir Adderley. The other two were in Chenna Nuosu um, and Kenneth Murray. Elaborate on what your perspective was. Obviously, the article was fantastic on the breakdown, but mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to hear it from you as far as what your perspective was on that. I just had to write something. <laughs> Hey. Nah. Um, <laughs> Nas, here, Nas, Nas is one of those guys that the first year he came in injured and he had said I was coming in injured from college and so he kind of got himself right last year was just I, I'm not trying to speak ill because I like Gus I like Gus Bradley but I've heard a lot of negativity when it comes to Kenneth Murray has said some stuff um Drew Tranquil was like, I was covering Tyree Kill at one point. I'm like, why am I covering Tyree Kill? So some guys have come out and said that they weren't utilized the best way. Nas kind of kind of said something to that ex- ex- extent. So it's interesting to see if if Gus is just one of those guys that's like, here's my system. Either you fit in it or you don't. So and Brandon's more of let's let's fit our system around the players that we have. So Kenneth Murray said that last year they had him drop back. He's like, that's not my strong suit. That is the strong suit of Drew Tranquil. Not having Drew Tranquil last year hurt because at one point you had Kenneth Murray and Denzel Perryman, who both are more of attacking the court, the opposing quarterback, going after the running back, not covering a tight end. That's more Drew Tranquil speed. <clears throat> so, um, so Kenneth said that he's going to rush the passer a lot more and he's going to be able to do some sideline to sideline. To me, that basically means he's going to play with his instincts. Where he feels like he needs to be, that's where he's going to be. So that's what they really need. To, that's how you play Kenneth Murray. Kenneth Murray is more about his instincts and where he feels like he should be in the play. That's why that New England game, I feel like he said F it, went in there and just played at his speed and played whatever he wanted to do. That New England game, yeah, they got blown out 45-0. to zero, But even before they were blowing them out, Kenneth was playing really well and Kenneth was making plays. So I feel like that's the kind more of the Kenneth Murray that you're going to see this season. Uh, he had a hundred tackles, even even with that uh, in the, in Gus Bradley's Bradley system, he had a hundred tackles. Imagine in Brandon Saley's defense, he could uh, he could jump up and maybe even become a Pro Bowl talent. That because that's that's what I think he's going to end up being. I think he's going to end up being a Pro Bowl t- t- uh, type of linebacker. He has the instincts, he has the play, he has the motivation. And when you jump over at Uchenna Nuosu, it, it, it's time for it to click for him. It's been his rookie season. You saw the um, you saw the the glimpses, the the little glimpses there where maybe he could be a good pass rusher. You saw the he um, Lamar Jackson. He knocks it out of his hand, and and you really thought, oh, maybe he can uh, go up. But he's been injured. He's had some freak stuff happen to him. I think Brandon's gonna be put him in the best position to succeed. I think he's gonna be a guy to really look for this season, just because he's gonna be playing opposite Joey. Joey needs somebody. You can't just have Joey Bosa and say, go go get the quarterback. It's not going to work. Last year, you saw it at times. The, Joey had three guys on him at times, and he was still trying to get through. And that Buffalo game, oh, crap. He was getting through three defenders. That That's what was incredible to me. But Uchenna is going to need to step up. He said he was watching Leonard Floyd film, which I understand. But at the same time, Leonard isn't like you guys aren't the same size. Leonard's six foot five, freak athlete. Like you're more of. Uh, using your speed to kind of get around the edge, kind of similar to Melvin Ingram, I guess. But Uchenna is another guy that you need to look at. I mean, he could easily get seven or eight sacks this season and really impact the defense. But I know the Chargers want to get back to what they did in 2018, which was uh, sack the quarterback, take the ball away, create plays. I think it was 17 where they were picking off a lot of, they were making a lot of interceptions and returning them for pick sixes and stuff. But that's what they kind of want to do, a mix of 2017 and 18 where they had one of the top defenses in the NFL, one of the top offenses in the NFL, and then obviously you need to have a top uh, a top special teams 
because that's really what's been uh, been their anchor the last few years. One of the one of the thoughts we had talked about the draft last time you had you on the show, and we had talked about like the importance of them hitting on some of the players this year. You look at last year, you know, we got Kenneth Murray, we got Justin Herbert, and you know, Justin Herbert's the trump card. How would you say this year compared to last year in terms of just did they do as well? And did they hit on the things that you think that they needed to going into the draft? Um, well, they got their left tackle. They got Rashawn Slater. Uh, I thought they did. I think Josh Palmer is a guy that not a lot of people are really recognizing. And I feel like he could end up being something special. I know they didn't need a receiver. Well, in my, if you ask me, yes, they did need another receiver. If you have somebody like Gilbert, my co-host at Compas on the Beat, he didn't think so. He said, no, you don't need another receiver. I'm like, I like Jalen, and he thinks I'm a Tyron Johnson and Jalen Guyton uh, hater, but I'm not. The reason why I say I like Josh Palmer and they needed another receiver is because there were times where Keenan and Mike were both getting double teamed and nobody else was stepping up. There was nobody to make those grabs, nobody to really make those catches and kind of move the chains a little bit. And Jalen Guyton was one of those receivers that would have two catches a game, and one of them was a 55-yard touchdown. That's incredible. That's great. But at the same time, you do need a nitty gritty kind of receiver to do some dirty work besides Keenan and Mike. And I feel like Josh could be that kind of guy. If you if you put out if you put out Keenan Allen in the slot, Jared Cook, um, Mike Williams, let's just say all three of them on that side. Then you have uh, Jalen Guyton and you have Austin Eckler. Dude, Jalen, everybody's going to be so distracted by the or Josh Palmer, not Austin Eckler, Josh Palmer. They're going to be so distracted by these guys that Jalen Guyton and Tyron Johnson are going to come open even even more than they were this year. Because there were times like I was there at the Las Vegas game where uh, Jalen Guyton had a step over on. I can't remember who he was uh, at the end of the game in overtime. He was able to hit um, Jalen Guyton for that long pass. That's the Raiders. There you go. Yeah. Against the Raiders. That stuff is going to open up. It's going to open up even more if you have a weapon like Josh Palmer there. And Tyron Johnson and Jalen Guyton are more like the fourth and fifth receiver. They're going to get a way more looks. They're going to get more open. So in my opinion, I thought the Josh Palmer thing was great. Um, Hi- Hymas, I think um, the guard, I think he could end up being a starter. I know Odea Abuji has the is penciled in right now as a starter, but I think um, I think that guy's. I think he's one of those like Pittsburgh Steelers kind of guards that is just going to like, he's going to be a, not a thug, but like, he's going to be one of those like guy blue collar guys. that's just going to knock dudes flat on their tails. I really think he's one of those guys that really could end up being a good uh, selection for them. I liked Osande Samuel jr. I thought that was a good, a really good selection. I couldn't believe that Slater and uh, Samuel fell right into their laps, especially with everything they're trying to do. Uh, I just thought, they were going to have to come up on the draft. Gilbert and I were actually watching the draft together and the first round. And I thought Dallas or Philly was going to take it Rashawn Slater because Philly needs to re- retool that offensive line. So does Dallas. And Dallas takes Micah Parsons. And I turn to Gilbert and I go, this dude just fell into their lap. And yeah, Rashawn Slater falls into their lap. By the way, his dad is humongous. Oh, <laughs> my God. His, I was like, who is that guy? That guy's humongous. And then I see it's like Reggie Slater. I'm like, Oh, yeah, he did play in the NBA. I completely forgot. He was huge. The incredible part about Rashawn Slater, though, is that I think I I think I remember reading this, that he only won three games in his high school career or something like that. Like, he didn't win a lot of football games, and he was recruited by Northwestern. But I was just like, wow, imagine a kid who only had, like, three or four wins in his senior year or junior year. I can't remember which one it was. And he's now on an NFL team and about to start as, as their left tackle. Like, that's thing. That's an incredible story in, in and of itself. But when you ask me, did I feel like they hit? Yeah. Trey McKitty another guy that I think is a little underrated. I think he's going to be a, a, a Virgil Green kind of um, tight end, which people think that that's a bad thing. But I don't think it's a bad thing. You need a guy who's really going to do everything for you, who could who could block, but also go on a fly pattern and end up or a seam route and catch a pass and turn it into a quick 15 yard gain. I think that's what Trey McKitty is going to become for this team. But yeah, no, I, this is probably the best draft in the, and I've been around for the whole Tom Telesco era so far. So I think this has been the best draft that he's had. Even though last year, yes, he got Justin and he got Kenneth, but that's only two players. Here, he really did, as of right now, hit the hail, uh, hit the the nail on the head with pretty much every one of his picks. It's they all seem like they're going to be good players. 
good solid players who um who are leaders of their teams and are going to come into this team and and uh have a good head on their shoulders so i definitely think this is t- tom telesco's best draft I want to circle back around real quick with the coaching aspects. I know we talked to ad nauseum already about That's Brandon cowboy Staley. Of you, cowboy esque of you. You want to circle back? Oh, <laughs> yeah. We're going to be paying Dak the money. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't uh, have that forty million dollar yacht, Jake. Yeah, no, I don't got Unless that. Unless you're you hiding know. it in the backyard, because I'd love to get on it. Yeah, you know, it's unfor- Yeah, it's, it's yeah, just get a line. I, three I saw it in Miami. You know? I saw it in Miami last year. Oh crap! I think it's humongous. It's That's huge. like a. That was like a penthouse on freaking on the on the ocean, like probably even better. It was just it looked amazing. And then I was I remember I asked one of his people, I'm like, hey, is he doing tours on there? She's like, real funny. I was like, okay, sorry. Like, <laughs> I just wanted to see, like, <laughs> hey, I'd pay i I'd pay 10 bucks to shoot your to, shot, dude. Yeah, I'd pay 10 bucks to get a tour of his yacht. Hell there yeah. you go. <laughs> but I, I really? want to take a picture where he was sitting uh during the draft. Just just take a picture like this, be like Jerry, like, oh like <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but what did you want to circle back to? Yeah, let me let me get back to that. Uh, we've already been talking about Brandon Staley's philosophy and obviously your perspective on it, Fernando. And from what you've been saying has echoed a lot from the players talking about it, just as far as playing more free, getting more of that freedom to yeah. do, as you said, put them in the best position to win. I want to talk a little bit more about the positional coaches. For Joe Lombardi, I feel like he's kind of gotten a mixed bag of perspectives just from outside Chargers fans. I know that we're very intrigued about what he's going to bring to this from what he did with Sean Payton and the Saints, but a lot of people always go back and they they look at that one year in Detroit and, and you know and and try to talk down on it's like well it, there never was really an uh, a big offense you know that he led a good season that he had outside of. His, his years with with Sean Payton. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then I wanted to get into Darius Swinton, the special teams coach. But from what you've observed so far, what's the biggest difference that you've seen going from Shane Steichen to now Joe Lombardi? Uh, well, you, you talk about the freedom. I mean, I don't want to speak ill of Shane, but I think there was a lot of cover-ups last year with some of the mistakes that were made, like the Buffalo uh the QB sneak on on that first down with like eight seconds left in the game. Um, I think there was numerous mistakes made by Shane. I feel like he was still kind of getting the groove. I understand the the question marks with Joe Lombardi because, dude, you say a year, but it was it was a year in like four games, and it was pretty bad. Like, and he had Megatron, he had Matthew Stafford. The only problem is that I've always said this: having a player like Megatron is incredible, but you're not going to win Super Bowl titles with him because. Your quarterback is just, and Matthew Stafford did this. All he would do is just go, oh, chuck sh- it. Yeah, just chuck it up and see, hope Megatron came down with it. So I understand the frustration there, but yeah, you're right. The offensive line wasn't there. The running game wasn't there. There was a lot of question marks about the Detroit Lions roster, but then the problem is that they turned it around once Lombardi was gone. So I, I, I'm also with you. I think he's learned from it. Drew Brees was out there last week, and he told us, he's like, this this system is going to be very good, and it's not just the New Orleans Saints system. And I feel like that's where people are getting a little confused. They're leaning heavily on their position coaches. Um, the um, God quarterbacks coach um, Shane Day. Shane Day. There you go. Thank you. They're going to lean heavily on Shane Day. They're going to lean heavily on the positional coaches. I think like we've never seen before. I feel like the thing, and that's the thing. They're saying they're going to run stuff from the Green Bay Packers offense, from the New Orleans Saints, from the San Francisco 49ers, and some of the things that he liked. My thing is, what they're bringing from San Francisco is the run game. Fans think that Justin's just going to throw 50 times a game, and that's not what it's going to be like. People are like, oh, Anthony's not here anymore. That means he's going to be able to run the ball. That's not what's going to happen. They're going to run the football, and they're going to try and use less of Herbert in a sense. But when they use Herbert, use him in a way where – I don't know if I'm saying this right, but like if use him in a way where he doesn't have to throw that many times in a game, get tired or, or any of that. They want to lean on on being a um, an offense that really goes 50 50 and is able to score on a long t- uh, touchdown run. I don't know if I'm making sense, but like that's what I mean. Like they're trying to they're trying to be they want to be versatile. But at the same time, it's not going to be just in just throwing the ball down the field. It's going to be running the football. San Francisco, that's why I think all four running backs are going to make this squad. All four of them bring something different. 
And you saw what the way San Francisco rode that to the Super Bowl. They were riding different running backs, handing it off to different guys, using different guys. And the way they opened up the offensive line and the schemes that they used to open up the offensive line, I feel like that's what Shane Day is going to bring. I know he's the quarterback's coach, but he ha- he knows what the roster is, or he knows what what the scheme was, how to open up the run game, how to do different things like that. So, um, so Joe Lombardi's system will fit this team because they kind of have the sim- the similar players. So a guy like Keenan's going to do what Keenan does, but I think Keenan's going to be more inside now. I don't know how much outside he's going to play. Uh, Mike is going to be in the Michael Thomas role, according to Joe Lombardi. And uh, Drew Brees told us that fits Mike ex- well. I've always thought in the past that Mike Williams is a – I like Mike Williams. I think Mike Williams is an underrated player. I think he's one of the clutchest receivers in the NFL. I think he's one of those guys that you could really count on at the end of the game to get you a big-time catch. And some fans, for some reason, don't notice that or it goes uh, unscathed maybe because they lose those games. But I still feel yeah, like Saints. it's not on Mike. Yeah, Saints, uh, Mexico City, where he made that grab against the um, against the Chiefs in, at the end of the game, and then Phillip throws an interception. The game against Denver, where he catches it against his helmet, and they end up losing that game on a on a bogus Casey Hayward uh, penalty at the end of the game. Um, but sure. I feel like that goes underrated. I think they need to use Mike, and I think Mike needs to get more catches this year. Mike last year showed me a lot when Keenan was down. Mike was really the receiver that Justin counted on. I remember that play because people were like, oh, all Mike knows how to do is go long. I remember that play against the Jets where he cuts inside. Uh, Justin throws him a pass. He literally grabs both the receiver and the safety, slams him to the ground and walks into the end zone. Like, I'm like, why aren't they doing more of those plays for Mike? And I remember I asked uh, Shane last year, oh, we're going to try and emphasize him a little bit more. And I'm like, but you didn't like uh you haven't so i mean it was just like one of those things where you're like okay so i really think that they they need to emphasize uh they need to emphasize him more i think mike needs to play a bigger role but when you ask me about joe lombardi i get the questions but the thing is justin can pick up any system i think he really is going to have a lot more freedom in this system i feel like the Chargers may trust him in uh, the sense of, hey, you can change the play if you need, if you feel like you need to call out. Last year, that's what I heard from some players that Herbert called out of a lot of plays. He would sometimes change the plays because he felt confident enough to make some changes at the line. So I feel like the Chargers are going to do that. And then another thing is, you guys know this: Brandon Staley was a former quarterback, so he understands offenses. It's not like uh, it's not like Brandon it doesn't know. It's not like Brandon's just going to let Joe do everything on offense. Brandon's going to have a little bit of his input into that offense because that's what a a head coach does. He has a little bit, a little bit of input in all three uh, phases of the game. And so I'm sure Brandon's going to put a game plan or they're going to put a game plan together to help the offense succeed. So I think, I think when we talk about um, this offense, I think uh, Brandon is going to have a little bit more say in this. And I feel like he's going to, he's going to be able to, to, um, to control a little bit more of what's going on. But I think Joe's grown. I think Joe has grown a little bit since uh, his time in Detroit. He went back to New Orleans. He learned a little bit more. So I'm sure Joe seems like he's le- he felt like he's learned off of this. Drew Brees basically told us that he feels like Joe has grown from the last time he had an opportunity. So I really do think that this offense uh, should be a lot better than it was last year, especially with the improved offensive line. We're talking to Fernando Ramirez, covers the Chargers for Sports Illustrated, man of the people. Now, I have a question for you. Now, I have an answer for you. I like this. Generally, typically, I am the optimist. Jake is generally more pessimist. Brings brings me back down to earth. Generally is a a kind word to use there. That's my optimism. So I've always heard you as the optimist, really. And I've... (laughs) I'm 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 more in the middle, so uh, so I, I'm sure I can answer this. Okay, this will be good. So I think everyone is over the moon about Justin Herbert and how amazing he has been and how great he's going to be. Not that I'm wanting to temper expectations or I'm wanting to like pump the brakes on the hype train, but maybe Ooh, the question rolls. No, no, but the the question is why <laughs> why should Chargers fans feel like they don't need to worry about him having like the sophomore slump or him having like the RG three year where he's a great rookie and then just goes to the tank. Like, 
What makes him different? Because he's Justin Herbert. I mean, the kid... I, I don't blow smoke up people's rear ends. Like if I think if I really do think that somebody's good, I can tell you. And this kid is something else. I mean, I really think the reason why I believe in this and in him is the one simple fact that this is a sixth offensive coordinator in six seasons. This is his fifth head coach in six seasons. He's learned every single time. His dad told me, you need to challenge him. The kid needs to feel like he's learning every single day and he will succeed. That's what Brandon Saley's doing with him. Another thing is, too, Brandon is sat down with him, from what I've, I understand, and they went through every single game that he played last year, every single snap he played, and Brandon explained to him what the opposing defense was doing. Last year, yes, he had an incredible season. But fans forget he did have a bad stretch. He played bad against the Patriots. He played bad against Buffalo, and he played bad against Miami. And granted, not everybody came to play those games. Um, the offensive line was surely not helping, but um, but Justin had bad games. They were doing the zero uh, the zero the zero coverage where they would well, and they disguised it so they would look like they were all going to blitz. Justin would check out of something. And they would drop back into coverage. Justin was like, oh, crap. Like, okay, maybe. Like, I think he got confused a little bit by it, which it wasn't just him. There was also some other uh, some other folks who got uh, confused by it as well. Um, and so I really do think that Justin is going to learn from all the mistakes from last year. And I think he's really going to grow this season. Again, I've told people, I, I was on Kirk Morrison's show a couple of days ago. I've been on other shows where I tell people, would I be surprised if Justin threw 55 touchdowns this year, broke the record, and uh, was just a, had a laser for an arm and maybe the league MVP? No, I wouldn't be surprised. Would I be surprised if Justin had the same numbers that he had last year and still had a great season? No, I wouldn't be surprised. Would Okay, now, would I be surprised if he regressed? Hell yes, I would be. Because I don't think Justin's going to regress. I think Justin's one of those guys that, and I and I understand that the whole Joe Lombardi, all this stuff. Gilbert's also on that train where he's kind of like, oh, but what about this? What about that? I just think Justin is so good. He's so, um, he's such a good quarterback that I feel like he could overcome. I mean, he overcame some of the stuff last year with uh, <laughs> Shane Steichen and and some of the mishaps on offense. He overcame that stuff and really balled out. And I mean, I would have understood like. I don't think he balled out. Like I understand the way RG3 balled out his year, but I think it's been said that RG3 really didn't know much of the offense. He was just going out there and playing. Justin understood the offense last year. Justin um, Justin had some... I mean, dude, he, he went up against Tampa Bay, and I know it wasn't the Tampa Bay that ran to the Super Bowl and won it, but still, he went up against Tampa Bay, and he threw up three touchdowns against them. Then a week later against New Orleans, who's another top defense in the NFL, lights him up for four touchdowns. You don't do that by accident. I think, and Jake, I, I think, I don't know if you saw this, but he was on the Rich Eisen show, or he was, uh, Keenan Allen was on the Rich Eisen show, and they were talking about Justin Herbert, and they were saying how, like, yeah, and he wasn't saying it in a bad way, but he's like, dude, like, Justin Herbert didn't know what he was doing last year. Like, he's a rookie, like, he's just thrown out there, and it's just going off of instincts, but, I mean, he knew what he was doing in terms of him being prepared, but just, you know, NFL experience is a whole different ballgame, and so... It was just interesting to even hear folks like Keen Allen kind of preach to how well they think Herbert's going to do moving forward. Well, and, the, and the thing is there, I don't think he knew what he was doing the first two games, but I do think he knew what he was doing against Tampa Bay. I think that's really when he clicked for him because there's no way you can go up against Carolina and really like do – he played bad, but it was his second game – but then how the hell do you go down to Tampa Bay and you almost light them up and you almost beat them? Like, I think he had a real understanding of what he was doing. And then that throw to Tyron Johnson and that other throw to Jalen Guyton, even the one, oh, you know what? Even the one that Donald Parham, I don't think a quarterback who's just going off of instincts can make those throws. That is, he's prepared. He knows what the offense is running and he sees the vision down the field. That was one of his knocks, his vision down the field and his vision down the field last year was incredible. So I really, I, I understand the whole instinct thing, but I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to say, I think by that point, he understood the offense. He understood what was going on. And I think he really, um, he really took over that team, that Tampa Bay game. I think he really took that over. And then from the rest of the season on, he really did play incredible. But 
But that Tampa Bay game to me is always going to be cemented in my head. And even the New Orleans game where he just took it over. And then that throw to Mike in, um, in New Orleans, the, the one day that touch pass that he gets him that down the field on to get him in field goal range and everything like that was just incredible. So I, I, I understand what Keenan means. But I think at one point, um, Justin really did understand it and he was able to succeed. And you go back to that Tampa Bay game. It's interesting just to hear your vote of confidence, Fernando, and what you've seen, and obviously, you know, what you think that he's going to be. And if there is going to be a sophomore or something, are you going to be surprised? Yes. But then to watch what he did against Tampa Bay, and then to hear a quote from Bruce Arians earlier this year saying, hey, man, yeah. changing coordinators could be a really bad thing. <laughs> we really just don't think that that's going to be that big of a hurdle for Justin Herbert to overcome. I, I just think it was Bruce Arians trying to vouch a little bit for uh, Anthony Lynn's staff, which I mean, I get it. Uh, people, people can say whatever they want or whatever, but I mean, you did kind of need to like, I understood why they made all the changes that they made. Um, I understood why, like, I don't know if he was trying to say like, Oh, at least keep Pep Hamilton. That you you couldn't keep Shane Steichen. I mean, you really you really couldn't. So maybe he was saying, "Hey, why why did you let Pep Hamilton go? Maybe he should have stayed at the quarterbacks coach." But hey, I mean, Shane Day is a good is a good quarterbacks coach. I think he's really going to help Justin. Um, and then obviously getting a guy like Chase Daniel to come in, I think that's going to help him. It's going to be like having a second offensive coordinator on here, especially if he makes the roster. But um, but I, I really do think that uh, – I saw, I saw Bruce Arians quote, but I really think that um, you could literally, like, put me out there at offensive coordinator and I could, I could help Justin succeed. I mean, it's just – the kid's just awesome. I think he's, he's, he has a good head on his shoulders. And I really – he said – I asked him, like, hey, these next five weeks, you know, most guys will go to Cancun, they'll go to Cabo, they'll go travel and stuff. And I asked Justin what he was going to do. He's like, oh, I'm just going to be on my computer watching, uh, watching our film – but also as well watching the defense and their their schemes. I'm like, oh, you watch both? And then he's like, yeah, I have to watch both. He's like, yeah, I watch both to see what they're doing, to see some of their disguises, to see what they're going to be throwing at me so that I know exactly what they're doing. I was like, oh, wow. That's so our quarterback. It was, it, it was pretty impressive to hear Justin and kind of some of the things that uh, he was saying. You could tell he's grown a lot uh, mature-wise. He got bigger in the offseason. He looked big to me. I mean, bulked up. I didn't think, yeah, I think he bulked up a little bit. And then uh, obviously fans care about the hair. The hair is growing back. Um, so I think fans are excited about that as well. What, it, kind of switching gears just a little bit here. We've had a few players on the show. We've had Drew Tranquil. We've had Chris Harris, Dizzy Ratterly. Pretty much everyone, when we ask, you know, what the, who they're most excited to see on the field, the answer is always Derwin James, which – we don't need to go into that because every single person knows how important and how impactful Derwin James is and how excited we are to see him play. Other than Derwin James and Justin Herbert, because that's another easy one, who is a player or two that you are most excited to see this season specifically? Well, I mentioned him already, but Mike Williams is one of those guys that I really am interested to see how he takes the next step forward. I could get again, I would I wouldn't be surprised if Mike went uh what like 60 catches, 1,200 yards, and maybe eight touchdowns and really set himself up for a contract extension. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Mike went that crazy. But Mike is a guy on offense that I I want to see what he's able to do in this offense. If he really is going to play the Michael Thomas role, that means he's going to get a lot of balls thrown his way. I think Keenan needs that. Keenan needs somebody to really step up and kind of help him because, yeah, Keenan makes 11 grabs, but you got to you gotta kind of relax that body a little bit and kind of give somebody else – um, some touches too. So I really do think that um, Mike is a guy that I see on the offense. On defense, man, I want to see what Joey's going to be all about. I'm really excited to see what Joey's going to be about. That's a cheater. So I, that, I'm cheating there. So I'll give you another one. But I just want to see if Joey really is going to drop back. I want to <laughs> see. I want to see if he gets an interception or something like that. Nick had one a couple of years, his rookie year. He, oh, I think he didn't make it all the way into the end zone. I think he got stopped three or four yards before. So uh, so I want to see which Bosa brother scores a touchdown first. Oh, you know what? Nick might have already have scored a touchdown on a fumble recovery. I can't remember. But uh, I want to see if Joey can uh, can do that. But on defense, who am I excited to see? You know what? I want to see Michael Davis on this uh, Chargers defense. Michael Davis is a guy that I didn't think he was going to get re-signed. I thought, uh, and I, I might have said it on here. I can't remember. 
But Michael Davis was the guy that I thought would go into free agency and maybe go to the Raiders with Gus Bradley over there. Um, no, that was the other guy. That was Casey Hayward. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> no, oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, my bad, my bad. yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant that. That was a the other that uh, Chris Harris had. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So Michael Davis is a guy that I think has grown a little bit, but I still have my, I still have some question marks about him. But I feel like Brandon Saley could really help him grow. Brandon Saley loves saying his nickname Bato. So every time he does that, Gilbert and I turn to each other and we start laughing because we just think it's funny, like the way he says Bato. And so, like every uh, next time when I hear him say "Orale Holmes," like I'm I'm waiting for him to do that. Um, but uh, but definitely, I think Michael Davis is a guy to watch just because I want to see how much more he can grow. According to Brandon, and I asked Brandon Saley, "Why did you guys resign Michael Davis and not go after one of your own?" Go get Troy Hill or go get some. I know Troy Hill is a is more of a slot corner, but I thought maybe he'd go with somebody who could help him teach some of these other guys his system. But no, he decided to go. Uh, he decided to resign uh, Michael Davis, and he said, "I don't feel like he's reached his full potential yet. I feel like we could help him reach his full potential." Which to me, I'm really interested to see what it is because I've I've told you guys before. Sometimes he makes bad plays, bad decisions at crucial times, whether it's like yanking a guy down and then he gets called for holding or or pass interference or stuff like that. So I'm really interested to see how Michael Davis takes it over this year. Then I want to see if they're really going to put Michael Davis on Tyreek Hill. That that matchup to me is very interesting. They should. Last year, last year they did it a couple of times, but it wasn't as consistently as I wanted to see. So this year I want to see if they do do that. And by the way, Dan, Obviously, Derwin's going to be the most exciting guy like to watch. Joe. Dude, I'm still, and I, I can't remember who I told the other day this too, but I that that play against the his rookie year, when it's Thursday night football, they're playing for their lives against the Chiefs on Thursday night football. I remember Patrick Mahomes, uh, on the fr- this was the first touchdown to kind of get them going, uh, not the first touchdown of the second half where it kind of, uh, no, in the fourth quarter where it kind of got the, the ball rolling. Patrick Mahomes throws uh uh like a like not a screen but um oh a flat route. So uh Travis Kelsey was out in the flat. He throws it to him. I'm like, "Oh shit, this is going to be an easy like this is going to be an easy first down." Derwin comes from out of nowhere, grabs him, picks him up and then drops him. And I'm like, "Oh, damn, okay." And then he did that on Thursday on Sunday night football. He does that against uh James Conner. And James Conner is a big boy. Big dude. So I'm like, "Dude, this guy just like literally picks guys up and drops them." And I think Derwin is so hungry that that really, like, he's going to come out flying against uh, Washington. No, not even Washington, against um, the Rams. So that's going to be an exciting one to watch when you watch Derwin. I don't, even want, to, I don't even want to play against the Rams. You know what? And that's that's kind of what I want to ask Brandon. Are you going to let him play against these guys? Or are you just going to let him, like, kind of sit, like, the preseason? Because, I mean, Derwin's Derwin. Derwin knows. Yeah, but, I mean, you know what? You, but you have to get the rust off. Like, the way this is going to play out now is the first game is going to be like the first and the second game of the preseason. The second one's going to be like the third game where they kind of let the guys go till halftime. And the third game is going to be like the fourth game. So nobody plays. So man, this, this is going to get really interesting really fast, but I, I am, I am, I do want to watch Derwin play. And it's funny because Gilbert tells me that he feels like he's been cheated. And I'm like, why? He's like, I have not watched. He's like, I watched Derwin because Gilbert got hired the Sunday or the week before that Sunday night matchup against the Steelers. Hmm. So he's only watched one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games of Derwin James. So no, seven, then uh, five, the back end of the 2019 season. So he's only watched about 12. Oh, the only games that Joey Bosa and Derwin James have played together. Gilbert has been here for all those. So he feels cheated. So he really wants to watch Derwin play. (laughs) I want to take that conversation one step further because obviously we're in training camp purgatory right now. We don't have anything really ramping up until the end of this month. And we know that from OTAs. Uncle Fernando you know, needs us to relax. <laughs> namaste. Namaste. Bring it down a little bit, man. Yes, <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, but we know that not, not you know, everybody obviously hasn't been going full speed OTAs, but there's obviously a lot of intrigue with, you know, outside of the big name players of this team. I want you to give me two position groups. I want you to give me one for offense and one for defense. That's going to have a really healthy competition that we should be watching when training camp starts. Give me one for offense and one for defense. Uh, I want to I say the running backs, but to me, it's like, it's literally Austin Eckler, 
And then the mess between the three, Larry Roundtree, Joshua Kelly, Justin Jackson. And then if I go receiver, it's kind of cheap because, I mean, obviously there's so many. Res- no, you know what? Yeah, I have to go receivers. I mean, that one, like Gilbert and I were going through that the other day and we're like, okay, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Josh Palmer. And then he's like, why are you putting Josh Palmer third? I'm like, shut up. Josh Palmer. <laughs> uh, I'm like, then you get into, then you get into Tyron Johnson, Jalen Guyton, then KJ Hill, then, uh, Joe Reed. Reed, and then you're like, oh crap, like that's a lot of receivers on this team. So that's really where I think that it's going to be interesting and it's going to be a healthy competition. I think they're going to have a lot of competition at that receiving group. I just, I, I don't know who's going to come out of it. And it's like, everybody's asking, like, oh, who's going to come out of all this? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, I see a case for everybody, but like, I like Joe Reed. I thought Joe Reed was going to bring a lot of energy last year. He scores against the Jets and then he never, or the Jacksonville Jaguars, and then he never sees the ball again the rest of the season, unless it was like on special teams. And I'm kind of like, wow, okay, I just got gypped. Like, I should have been able to see more of this, but obviously we didn't. Um, So I think receiving group is going to be one to take a look at. Defense, defense, defense. Damn. Mm, Defensive line. I'm really interested to see what the defensive line is going to be like. Um, uh, Justin Jones has been the starter, but I Limbaugh Joseph to me last year, I think he was the most underrated charger, uh, player. I just think talk about every it single time, every single time I saw a play, like if a running back took off running, I, I, I remember watching other defensive linemen in years past that would just be like, oh, okay, he left Limbaugh Joseph was running after him and still trying to make the play. So I think Limbaugh is one of those guys that really is going to make a name for himself. Uh, Braden Fayoko, I think, is going to maybe step up this year, maybe be one of those guys that fights really hard for that roster. Christian Covington is another guy that I really look at, and I'm like, oh, wow, he could make the roster. But to me, defensive linemen is where they're most vulnerable in a sense. Maybe that's just me being a, a pessimist, but I think they need more. I think they need more at defensive line just because they're going to face a lot of really good running backs this year. And that's really where you're kind of like, Ooh, like you're facing a lot of like even at the beginning of the season they're facing a lot of the top backs in the nfl and it's kind of like are do you have the capacity to stop these guys especially because i'm telling you right now washington is going to run the ball a lot with gibson i don't i think they're i i know fitzpatrick is there fitz magic but i know that i think they're going to try and run the ball and kind of settle everything um uh, sorry. So uh, I, I think they're going to um, I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of the way they uh, they run things. But um, but definitely, I think the defensive line is is a is a roster. Um, it's kind of one of those position battles you're going to need to take a look at because it's going to be a battle to see who who makes that uh, roster. Because before, I mean, you knew it was going to be Justin Jones no matter what. And now it's kind of like, well, it's a new coaching staff. What if they like so and so, or they like this guy? So, but Jake, don't worry. Aaron Donald's not walking through that door, so don't get a, don't get that excited. <laughs> now, I'm not that excited. Yet. I'd love to see Aaron Donald and Joey Bosa on the same. Can you imagine? Offensive oh line. God. <laughs> that wouldn't even be fair. Yeah, we're, no. we're wrapping things up with Fernando Ramirez from Sports Illustrated. We have one more question for you, Fernando. And everyone was hyped about the Rashawn Slater and Asante Samuel Jr. picks in this draft. Which of those two need to play best in order for this team to be successful? Rashawn Slater. Rashawn Slater needs to be that cement wall that everybody thinks he's going to be. They need him to be that cornerstone left tackle that you're going to have for years. The Chargers haven't had that since Marcus McNeil. I remember how Marcus was uh, during his great times down here in San Diego. Marcus literally would not let anybody get past him. He was literally six foot nine, humongous. He would not let anybody get past him. So I think Rashawn Slater needs to be that that Pro Bowl left tackle that they need. They haven't had it. They had um, Jared Geither. They had, remember him. They pay him. <laughs> Do you remember that? They pay him. He le- like he's now on the men for years to come. Like he literally never played. Um, they've had other makeshift, uh, Mike Harris jr. Um, God, who was their left tackle during, uh, during the 2013, it was DJ Fluker. It was Chris. Er, oh, no, King Dunlap. Um, you had King, King Dunlap. Dunlap. Yeah. King Dunlap. Uh, I still remember one time I covered an event 
where <laughs> they played dodgeball and it was King Dunlap, Keenan Allen, uh oh, gosh. God, Melvin Ingram. Um, I can't remember the rest of the players. Dude, they were like they were playing the cops, like the uh San Diego PD. Uh somebody throws one at, at King Dunlap's face. He gets so pissed, he grabs the ball, throws it at the cop, and breaks the cop's like nose. And I was like, oh my god. But like I tell you, like that thing was like zooming. I was like, oh crap. And so, like, then from then on, like, King's like, you like that? And I just started, la- like, to me, I was like, I'm never messing with you when you have uh, nope. when you have a, a dodgeball in your hand. He started laughing. And obviously, the Chargers players won. Like, they were knocking people out. Like, they like they played a local DJ radio station. Like, they knocked them. Like, the Chargers didn't eliminate anybody. Like, they didn't, they didn't get eliminated. They didn't eliminate one single player. I was like, dude, like, these guys are crazy. They ended up winning the trophy and everything. But, um... But it was hilarious. But yeah, King Dunlap. They've had um, then Russell Okung. So Russell Okung was serviceable, but you need that guy that's just going to be there for the next 10 years. I think Rashawn uh, is going to end up being the better tackle out of this draft. I think Rashawn has the tools to do it. Another thing, too, he has the leadership on his team. He has Corey Lindsley. He has Brian Bulaga. I really think those guys are really going to step up and help him and help d- with his development. So I really do think that Rashawn Slater needs to become that left tackle this year, especially right off the gate. You're playing Chase Young. Like, you're going to need to be that guy right off the bat because you don't want Chase Young anywhere near your quarterback. You don't want Von Miller. You don't want any of these guys near your quarterback. So to me, that's an easy question. Even when you were asking, I'm like, Rashawn Slater, like, that's it. Like, that guy needs to be what he was billed to be because of uh, – because his pro- his um, his production – means how this offense is going to go in a sense so i really do think it, it, it rests on rashawn slater more than it does uh Asan- and not saying that asante doesn't need to be good this year he does but they're going to count a lot more on rashawn on the offensive line okay then i'll make it hard okay rapid fire real quick five seconds you don't get much time to answer this because you're gonna probably have to go back and forth rashawn slater justin herbert who needs to play better uh rashawn slater because if rashawn slater plays well that means justin herbert's gonna play better so uh, as long as Rashawn Slater does his job, Justin Herbert should be able to do his. So boom. Dang. That's, Wait a minute. That's, Hang on. Since that, was, since that ended up being so easy. Okay. Who's got the better corn dogs? Wiener schnitzel or hot dog on a stick? Hot dog oh, on a stick. Yup. Hot dog on a stick. I, yeah, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for Fernando to put on one of those hats and start making us some lemonade. That'd be awesome. No, hell no. No, <laughs> you know what's funny? You know what's funny? I applied there in high school and they told me no. And I'm like, why? They're like, look at your competition. It was like three beautiful women sitting right there. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I get it. Like, yeah. I'm like, nobody wants to see okay. anybody shake. They don't want these milkshakes to shake. They're not looking for these milkshakes to shake. You're want beautiful that. too, Fernando. You are beautiful too. I, I appreciate that. I like to think so. I mean, I'm I, I'm like if you love uh ham porter from the sandlot, that's the kind of guy I am. Like walking around, I'm like, ooh, sexy. And then he's like <laughs> waving at them and he's like and he's like cannonball and he throws himself in the pool. That's the kind of guy I am. So it's all good. Like if you if you like ham porter, come on down. So yeah. uh but yeah, no, definitely um but definitely uh hot dog on a stick is and then it's like some like, and especially like one time, I remember I got a corn dog from Winterson Shaw like eleven o'clock at night, and it tasted like plastic. And I'm like, crap. So the next day I had to go to Hot Dog on a Stick, and it tasted fresh. It tasted delicious. So I was like, okay, there you go. But yeah, corn dogs, Jackie, corn, corn dogs, dogs for all these people. <laughs> I love that scene. Oh my god! You know it's funny. One of my coworkers from NBC, he lived in Jacksonville at the time. That's where they were recording that scene, and he was able to be an extra uh, in the bear scene. So he said oh, he was nice. there and that he's like, run for your lives. And he's like, and he like, he gets up and he like takes off running and everything. I was like, what was that like? He's like, dude, it was the coolest thing in the world. He's like, to hear Will Ferrell. And he's like, then one of the producers yells at Will. Cause, uh, cause he grabs the micro. Like he wasn't supposed to grab the microphone while he's on the floor. He's like, your refund will be escaping here with your lives. <laughs> he said that he did that off. Like it was impromptu. Oh, and that, so I was like, dude, good. that is so awesome. But Priceless. I don't know if he's like, you have you seen four Christmases? Yeah, I have. Okay, okay, okay. So you know that Reese Witherspoon never wants to work with Vince Vaughn again because uh, most of Vince Vaughn is impromptu. The part where they're at the church 
And he's like, woman, give me that uh, baby. And I, Joseph, shall swaddle this baby. <laughs> like, that was all impromptu. That's not the way it was supposed to go. And they said that Reese Witherspoon was so pissed oh. at the way Vince Vaughn did. But I'm like, dude, that That's what makes it good. It's so good. Ever. Like, he swaddles the baby. And he like, he's like, forgive her, son, for she knows not what she's done and then he gets up and he goes like that but the funniest part is when he walks up and he's like he's like i need to get into character and he's like i'm gonna blow the roof off this bitch and then he's like <laughs> he gets all serious and he gets all into it i'm like yes vince vaughn you're amazing by the way wedding crashers 2 has begun production yes sir wow. when did and this full, news break a couple of weeks ago the full cast is coming back too all, oh, of them. all four of them so i'm like dude like this is gonna be epic at the end of the movie i loved it how he, uh, Owen Wilson goes, the Shirigamis are getting married. That means great sushi. <laughs> and then uh, what's her name is like, uh, she's like, we're uh, traveling, uh, traveling singers yes. who uh, got invited to this wedding and then the, like going to that fake wedding. So I'm excited. I'm excited for all these movies coming out tomorrow. Like I said, or Friday, I get to go watch Fast and Furious 9. I'm hyped. Did you see That's In the Heights? Hyped. Did you see In the Heights? No, I did not. What's that? Oh. Uh. What's is it that? like a like is it a single a single a musical? It's it's based on Lindo Miranda's. Oh, dude, do yourself a Man favor. Trust me. Sure, do yourself a favor. Watch on Man, HBO everybody Max. Thought I watched Coco. Heights. Everyone thought I watched Coco because I'm Mexican. I'm like, no, I haven't watched Coco. <laughs> everybody like, you haven't watched Coco? I'm like, no, just because I'm freaking Mexican doesn't mean I watch Coco. I'm well, like, I, if I, I to- watch. Look, I watched In the Heights and it was fantastic. And I have heard so many people who. Don't like musicals at all. Love it. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. I don't know if I'm going to watch a music. I don't know why. I just it, like if people aren't like like if it's not like American Pie, I'm not into it. Like there needs to be some crazy ass crap happening. To, I'm going to spend ten bucks to go watch Fast and Furious though. Woo-hoo-hoo. Okay, go find go find a drive-in. You can do you can do a double feature. You can watch both. Who would be playing Fast and the Furious and then in the Heights? Can you right imagine my the... adrenaline rush from Fast and Furious and then wham, <laughs> it comes down for in the Heights? You'd be yeah. surprised, Fernando. You'd be Dude, surprised. I watch Fast and Furious and then I want to go out and buy like a muscle car and go like drive the crap out of it. But then I forget I live in California and like that's frowned upon. So I could probably get arrested for driving the way they <laughs> so do. in those Tesla. Movies. They'll get a Tesla. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine um, you're driving, you know, <laughs> a muscle car down the street, and then you just saw a double feature of Fast and the Furious 9 and In the Heights, and you're driving this great muscle car down the street, and then all of a sudden you just decide to break out into song. Dude, I can't do it. Like, while driving? No, I couldn't do no. it. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I guess now. <laughs> Jake Papa, wants you to really, hear like, me? <laughs> <laughs> Dan really wants to have my, like, adrenaline rush go from like a thousand to like down to like negative five i don't know if i could do that but i'll Uh, chargers (laughs) unleashed listeners have seen this back me up and tell fernando that he is missing out i don't know what's gonna happen first fernando watching in the heights or jake watching moulin rouge i'm putting money on fernando because moulin rouge don't even we're not we'll save that for a different discussion jake is there anything else we need to ask our friend by the way, the last time somebody did that, Gilbert got crapped on because he's like, like there was a thing that said, I'm Mexican, but I don't like a certain thing. I said, I, I'm Mexican, but I don't drink alcohol. And Gilbert thought fans were going to crap on me for that one. And they ended up crapping on him because he doesn't like avocados. So, <laughs> Jay, uh, so Dan, you're about to get, you might get crapped on. So uh, I wouldn't go. <laughs> I wouldn't try and do that because some people might tell you in the Heights wasn't that good. And they'll be like, no, Fernando's right. So hey, but uh, Jake, hey. you got anything else left from the would... cowboy? Are you gonna circle around something else? And <laughs> ask me a question? You circle circle back on us, Jake. I was just gonna say, you know, you've got <laughs> you have Gilbert, who's only on Harry Potter three. I have to mm. live with Dan Wolkenstein only yeah. being on Captain America and the Winter Soldier, who I hasn't even watched. watched. That's exactly no, my point. I watched up to that. Dude, that's like literally like the third movie in the whole. Why don't we like, ask Jake? Why don't we ask Jake? Why I haven't watched more? You don't no, have no, no, no. That's not no, no. That's not the excuse. There you is don't have no excuse plus, do you, Dan. for that. And you Dan, even you told me this afternoon that technically you haven't even finished Captain America: Winter Correct. Soldier. You've only that's watched one, like the first one of, hour. One of the most underrated films is Captain America: Winter Soldier. That one is incredible. 
All right, I mean, we, we need to get Fernando in this then. Fernando, you watch In the Heights. I will watch the rest of Phase Two. So I'm, I'm you have to watch giving, one movie. I'm, I have to watch so like I'm four. Gifting you like the Marvel series, which is incredible, full of action, and you want to give me musicals? Like, yes, I, sure. I was, the, I was sure. the kid. I'm gonna make you. I, I'm gonna make you put up with a two-hour musical that you'll be we went, so we, excited. So, I graduated from college and my parents and us, like my family, we went to London for um, just on vacation and stuff for a graduation surprise or whatever. And we're watching Aladdin the musical. And my brother's like, yeah, I'm enjoying Aladdin. And all I hear is, <laughs> I was <laughs> not the hell out. I was out. You can't. That's why nobody takes me to musicals. I knock out. Like to me, a musical is, hey, welcome to a two hour sleep fest. So literally, I'm there for two hours. And, uh, <laughs> I fall. It doesn't matter what kind of musical okay, it is. Bye. At Disneyland, at Disneyland, Frozen. I fell asleep during Frozen. Like I was knocked out. Like literally KO'd watching Frozen. Like there is no other men I would rather build a snowman with than Jake and Fernando. No. God. <laughs> but you know what's funny about Way to that? Make it weird, dude. Way to you make know? it weird. Yeah, for real. Thank God we're not in the locker room. Uh, so, but honestly, I um, I my like everybody hates going to musicals with me because I will fall. Like there hasn't been one musical I've made it through. Like West Side. Oh no, no, no. There's one King Kong in brought on in New York. I went to a Broadway show. I watched King Kong. King Kong was freaking awesome. They had a big ass Abe come down and like they're making them run and do all this stuff. Like that was bad ass. That one I did not fall. No, no, no. I didn't fall asleep through it. So there you go. That's the only musical I've never fallen asleep through. But everything else, uh, Wicked and all that, I've fallen asleep through all that stuff. All right. Fine. I'm terrible. Fine. I'm well, terrible. For, for, you know, do you want to take, take us home? Do you want to take us home or you want Jake to take us home? I think Jake should circle back and take us home. <laughs> Unless you have something else for me, Jake. Do you have any other questions? Any other concerns? No. No, sir. I'm good. All I, I know mean, now is, the way is you guys that's not going the, away anytime soon. The way you guys schedule your friends, I might not be back until the season's <laughs> over. So, uh, that's yeah, a so burn. That's, that's a burn. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Well, Fernando... It's been a long time coming, sir, but we're very happy oh, yeah. to have you back on the show. No, uh, thank and you for having me back. Absolutely, man. And it's actually, you know, it's it's a nice pleasure. Just think about the little change just a couple months can make because before it was just a friend of the show. Now it's friend of the show and colleague of there the LA are. Football Network, and we love it. So uh, thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, Fernando, where can everybody find you on social media? Everyone can circle back on Twitter and go and find me on at Real Left Ramirez and on Instagram at the same one. And if you want to circle back to si.com slash chargers, you'll find my articles. I've been a little lazy this week, but I'll, I'll definitely be uh, throwing some more stuff out there and uh, bringing that fire uh, coming soon just because um, – there, I know Charger fans want to know more about this coaching staff, and I'm going to bring some of that stuff coming up soon. We got to talk to um, some of the assistant coaches and everything. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I definitely will be uh, doing some of that stuff coming up. But again, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's always fun. Um, I love talking corn dogs because because uh, of that. But uh, but I, again, guys, I appreciate you guys having me on, and it, it's always fun and it's always interesting uh, when the three of us get together. Yes, yeah, now sir. now we're now we're talking about you know dudes building snowmans together. It's Dude, just that always not, something. Okay, you, you just had to bring up another weird thing, didn't you, Jake? <laughs> You just that one's that, not going to go away, dude. That was just like no man melt. That, <laughs> you know, I, I should have done that. Yeah, I should have done that, but I didn't. Uh, but obviously, if you're <laughs> if you're still listening after all this crap, uh, you can follow us on Instagram <laughs> and on Twitter at lac underscore unleashed, and we'll circle back around with you next week on Chargers Unleashed. Hope you guys are enjoying the show. Before we go any further, I just want to remind you all that today's show is being sponsored by Brewery X. I have said it at nauseum. Dan and I have tasted their multitude of beers. My personal favorite, Slap and Tickle. If you haven't tried it, you got to go and try it. They have a multitude of beer and seltzer selections. Brewery X in Anaheim. If you are in the vicinity, even if you're not, even if you're down in San Diego, it's worth the trip. Trust me when I say this. Brewery X, fantastic beer selections. If you're a seltzer person, 
they got you covered there too. Brewery X in Anaheim, go check them out. They are a fantastic choice for a refreshment. The Los Angeles Chargers select Rashawn Slater. Asante Samuel Jr. Stop. Stop. Oh, I'm strapping y'all boys. That's going to Intercepted. Picked off by Michael Davis. Explosion. Explosiveness from Eckler. There's Murphy. Boy, he blew that up, didn't he? It is picked off. Nasir Adderley. 50-50 ball is 100%. Mike Williams. Ojeda, you won't sue. And that will end it.